What's up everybody, it's Charles. Today taking your questions on misfires, oil pressure, lights, cam chain tensioners, and more. This is episode 256 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. All right, if you want to get a question on a show like this, email me, charles at humblemechanic.com. Put question for Charles in that subject line. Ask your question, give me some space, then give me the details of that question. That helps me out so much when going through all of the emails that I get. Also, if you'd rather listen, this and many other videos are available in audio-only format on iTunes, Stitcher, Google, and of course, over at humblemechanic.com. All right, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. And finally, if you dig on the show, want to throw some support as well as score discounts to places like Black Forest, Eastwood, MT Knives, Sonic Tools, Scanner Danner, Kerma TDI, USP Motorsports, and a whole bunch more, check out that crew membership program. There is links to that and everything else we're going to talk about today. Of course, as always down in the description. One final thing I want to mention to you guys, I've just been doing a ton of traveling, and one of those trips was actually to a technician training seminar or conference, whichever you prefer to call it, called Vision High Tech Training. This is probably one of the biggest technician and shop owner focused training seminars in the U.S. About 3,500 attendees, I think I read. Amazing experience, a ton of great classes from pressure waveforms using an oscilloscope to advanced electrical diagnosis stuff, which I, I didn't think was super advanced. Uh, I think had we the class been two days, it probably would have gotten pretty advanced. And a whole bunch more. I highly recommend you check this out. Even if you work at a shop where like your boss doesn't pay for training, which I think is total crap, they should take care of you on the training part. Even if you're at a dealership, I don't really think it matters. I think this is a great investment in your career. It's like buying one of those high dollar tools that you know you may only use a couple of times, except you're probably gonna learn a whole bunch that you didn't know. I know I learned a ton. In addition to that, got to hang out with some great folks, some that I knew, met a bunch of cool people as well. Uh, so highly recommend it, check it out. I'll drop a link again down in the description. Uh, it just finished up this year, next year. It was in Kansas City and like crazy cold, but don't let that, don't let that stop you from getting some really solid, high level type training. And, uh, and again, meeting some really amazing, cool people. You know, if it, my thing with training is if I can get one stellar thing out of the class, hopefully more, but if I can get one rock solid thing I can take back to my shop and use, then it was well worth it. The four day training, I think is like 700 bucks, uh, well worth the 700 bucks. Even if you have to pay for it, my fellow technicians, it sucks that you have to, but I really, really think it's worth it. Either way, I think it's worth at least clicking on the website and paging through it and see if anything piques your interest. All right, all that wrapped up, let's hit these questions. First one up is from Ross. Hey Charles, my Volkswagen keeps having a reoccurring problem. I have a 2010 GTI four-door manual. Every once in a while at low speeds, like in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, or on a long trip, I get a warning message saying, warning, oil pressure off. See owner's manual taken it to my local VW dealership and had multiple diagnoses done. First, they thought it was my intake manifold, replacement under warranty, did the valve cleaning, said my cam bridge is leaking, estimated me $1,400 to replace it. They also told me I needed a new fuel pump and a fluid flush. Other thing I noticed is that I'm losing engine coolant, and every once in a while my car's AC slash heat has a weird burning smell. Any thoughts? Ross, Ross, my first thought is I'd probably want to get a second opinion on some of that stuff. I'm not sure why for an oil pressure light they would sell you an intake manifold. Perhaps you had a stored code, though, for the intake manifold. Uh, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Those intake manifolds fail pretty regularly. So the very first thing we need to do is we need to check our oil pressure. And we're going to actually take the oil pressure switch out of the filter housing and put a manual oil pressure gauge in it. And we're going to evaluate the oil pressure. We could probably even do something like using a picoscope and an oil pressure transducer if we got that equipment. Otherwise, just a simple manual oil pressure gauge is what we want to use to diagnose this issue. And we want to then put the car in the condition that you mentioned, bumper to bumper traffic, extended drive, whatever it is, and see is this an electrical issue? The signal from that switch or that switch to the ECM, to the cluster, right? Or is this actually an oil pressure problem? 
either one of these really, like this could really go either way on the oil pressure deal. I have seen plenty of those CCTA engines with clogged pickups from anything like the balance shaft cage for the bearings coming apart and dropping plastic down in the pan, or the oil pressure up top being a little bit low, or debris down in the oil, or sludge, or you know whatever, fill in, fill in the blank. I've also seen this be switches, the actual little sensor that goes into the oil filter housing, or wiring. There's a connector junction right behind the driver's side headlight that I've seen the wires break on for the oil pressure switch, causing an intermittent oil pressure light. It's not all the time, it's just intermittent. So that's something I would just take a quick look at that. I think it's like a 14 pin connector mounted right on the frame. You might have to look underneath the intake uh, boot. I don't remember if it's directly under there or just off to the side, but it's somewhere right behind that driver's headlight area. This is one of those cases where there's probably a pretty big disconnect between the customer and the shop. The shop sold or did an intake manifold under warranty. The shop said you have a leaking cambridge, which I'm sure it does. The shop said it needs a high pressure fuel pump or a fuel pump, I should say. It very well may, but that doesn't address the issue that the customer came in for. So th this is why we're getting the customer saying one thing, the shop probably saying another. It's that communication disconnect that really leads to most of the issues in the automotive industry altogether is poor communication because I think the automotive industry just all in all does a pretty bad job with communicating really important things to the people that need to have them communicated to. So really, Ross, the, the only thing I think from my end I would do um, is I would want to get an oil pressure gauge on it and actually monitor what the oil pressure really is. Is it within spec? Is it out of spec? Is it the oil changeover valve that this car probably has where the oil pressure is too high, too low? It just says oil pressure off um, or oil pressure warning, turn engine off. Uh, it doesn't say which way that goes, high or low. So, man, you got to know. You got to know whether this is a mechanical issue with the engine. We don't have enough oil pressure. Or is this an electrical issue? We have good oil pressure, but we're reporting that we don't back to the computer and then, of course, into the instrument cluster, which is where you're seeing the warning. So a uh, couple of options. Take it back to the same dealer. Have them readdress it because they didn't. Or get a second opinion and um, go, you know, independent shop, dealership, whatever, get a second opinion. This was a 2010 GTI, so there should hopefully in your area be some pretty good VW Audi Indy shops if you wanna go that route. But uh, you need to get this issue addressed because if it is a mechanical problem, you can cause some pretty severe damage to your engine. Now we're starting to think, do we have oil pressure issues? What about our timing chain? What about our timing circuit altogether, uh, our tensioner? We need to be concerned about that too. If you want to see a breakdown of what this engine looks like taken apart, well, a very similar engine like yours taken apart, I did a video on it. I'll link that up on the card and down in the description. So you can check that out and see kind of how that all plays together. But dude, got to get this one fixed. Don't wait too much longer. Get it in, get it addressed. And, you know, maybe even put a little pressure on the dealership saying, hey, I brought this in for this issue. We did a bunch of other work. We never addressed the oil pressure light. All right, next one up is from Izzy. My grandmother drives a secondhand 2012 Holden Cruise. This is the first Holden Cruise question I've ever gotten, so I'm excited about this. And honestly, it hasn't had the best of runs. Basically, it keeps rattling and shaking excessively when it's being started up or turned off or even at idle. I can't for the life of me figure out what it is. My grandparents in their old age are slowly starting to neglect their cars they drive, and I'm able to fix the easy stuff but if it's a major problem, I know I have to take it to the technician straight away since for me, fixing cars is only a hobby. Holdens don't really have the best reputation. So weird looks from mechanics saying things like, here we go again. I've checked all the things I can think of. Local mechanic also said he had no idea. Anyway, sorry for the babble. Love the show and heap of thanks for the videos. They have helped me out so much. From a lowly girl in Australia, Izzy. So uh, cheers in Australia. Boy, um... First off, I'll tell you, I, I don't know exactly what's wrong with this car. Of course, I'm going to give you a couple of things to check. Rough idle, rattling, shaking. These are all common signs of one of a few things. The first one I'm thinking of is probably a misfire fault uh, or a misfire situation, we'll call it. Uh, so this could be spark plugs, coils, wires, distributor, depending on you know whether what kind of setup this is, coil pack, any of that kind of stuff. 
first thing I would want to do is, if you can, get it scanned and see if there's any faults. A fault code may be stored that points you right to cylinder two misfire, and then we can start there. Next, what we'll do is we'll pull our ignition coils out or our spark plug wires off. And we'll check our spark plugs and see what they look like. We can check the gap. We can make sure they're tight. We can make sure they're the correct ones. I've seen so many VWs over the years misfire because they didn't have the correct spark plugs in it. So that's something you want to check. We also want to evaluate how long this has been going on. Um, maybe this is fuel related. Perhaps they got a bad run of fuel, which I've also seen before. Too much water, too much ethanol. Maybe it's just all kinds of upset. We also want to look at maybe bad engine mounts. You know, perhaps the car's not misfiring. That subtle vibration that the engine's always going to have is now amplified because the engine mount is broken. You know, there was VWs for years and years and years and Audis too that the mounts were filled with fluid and the fluid would leak out. This really wouldn't cause too much of an issue other than you had purple fluid leaking from your engine compartment. But eventually, if let go long enough, those engine mounts would really start to wear out and eventually break. And then what happens is the engine's just hopping up inside the engine bay. Doesn't sound like that's probably what you got going on. I'm gonna vote on the misfire side at this point in time. I think that's your most likely scenario. So we'll start with maintenance. Make sure your air filter's good. Make sure your spark plugs are good. Make sure your fuel is good. And then we kind of go from there. We wanna pull faults and see, even though the check engine light might not be on, there may be a pending code stored that'll at least give you something to go off of. This could be anything causing a misfire, if that's what it is, from an air leak, to bad spark plugs, to a coolant temp sensor, to bad fuel, and a, you know, worse, right? We don't wanna really dive too deep in the mechanical side of what could cause a misfire, because we're gonna hope that it's not that. Um, I, you know, it sounds like I would probably take it to somebody a little bit better than, than maybe the local mechanic you took it to, because a misfire is a misfire, right? Sure, I'm a Volkswagen dude, so that's you know where my compass points is to the VW side, but a misfire is a misfire. There's basic rules that an engine has to play by in order to function properly, and anybody really should be able to check that. They may not want to. You know, I was never thrilled at, as a VW dealer tech when a Ford came in for an issue, but ultimately, our job was to fix cars, so we would walk through it and order an ignition coil because that's always what it was every single time. <laughs> uh, so that's a couple of things I would go off of. If you don't find anything in that space, then I think it is time to take it to someone maybe a little more qualified or, or maybe not even qualified is the right word. Maybe just willing to work on that car more so than the dude that you took it to the first time. European cars are great about this. You bring it to a, you know, an everyday shop that works on all makes and models. Some love it because they know, hey, there's good money to be made. European cars may seem scary, but they're not that hard. And other ones will go, I don't want to work on this stupid Volkswagen or this dumb Audi. Take it to somewhere else. And you're really better off taking, when they tell you that, don't try and force them to. Take it somewhere else. They don't want to work on it. Don't have them work on it. Take it to somebody that's qualified and wants to work on those kind of cars. So Izzy, cheers. Thanks for the email from Australia. Good luck. And do me a favor, when you figure out what's wrong with the car, Come back and post it in the video so that uh, we all know what was wrong, and hopefully that'll help somebody else out. All right, next one up is from Chris. I have a 2015 S3 with 50K on it, 2 liter TSI engine. Random rough idle and stalls happen once or twice a month. No check engine light or other warning lights. Car starts fine and then runs fine. I'm really lost where to start. It's hard to replicate the issue for the dealer because it doesn't happen all the time. It's been cold in Dallas, so I'm wondering if that's been playing a role. You mentioned in a comment before scanning with a VW scan tool and looking for faults. I'm new to Vancom, so you could go into some detail as to what to look for. Also, you mentioned an air leak. Could you please elaborate? I don't see or hear any noticeable leaks, but I could always give it a more detailed once over. Thanks again for the awesome show. If you're ever in Dallas, beers are on me. Thanks, Chris. Chris, if you're gonna take it to a shop, I recommend my good friend Ryan Blair, Blair Automotive. Uh, that would be the place I would take it to if you're gonna take it somewhere. Good dude, former Audi technician, shop owner, rad guy, and uh, has a great shop full of technicians. So let's talk about a couple of things ugh, that might be going on. You know, diagnosing rough idles and things like that over video is very, very challenging. But let me give you a couple of things that I'm kind of thinking. First of all, uh, if you don't have VAGCOM, that's cool. If you do, I'll talk about what to look for in just a second. We want to start with a visual inspection. This is an intermittent issue 
So you may not find anything wrong with it visually, but it's worth a look over. Not only are we looking for air leaks, you know, leaking intake manifold, uh, leaking charge cooler, things like that. We want to look for oil leaks. Oil leaks on these cars can also be air leaks. Rear main seals are probably the biggest one of all. Also, PCV valve can make the car do some really goofy, dumb things intermittently. That is another ultra common failure point on, it seems like all the direct injection engines had PCV issues. So uh, that would be, you know, you might not see anything wrong with it. There may be a little tiny leak from the weep hole. It could be not that at all, but it's worth taking a quick look over. When you say it's cutting off, I always follow that question up with what do you mean? Is it shutting off like you took the key and turned it off, car just turns off, or does it shut off like you're running out of fuel? This can point you in different directions, right? If it feels like it's shutting off, like you turn the key off, now in my head, I'm thinking an electrical issue or some kind of signal issue. Maybe it's losing engine speed sensor. Maybe the ECM power supply relay is cutting off, killing the ECM altogether. Maybe it's a wiring issue with that engine speed sensor, the G28, and it's a loose connection and you just turn, you know, torque it just right and the wire separates, car cuts off. If it feels like it's running out of fuel, now maybe we're looking at something like a fuel pump dying or a fuel filter, reg the pressure regulator and the fuel filter getting wonky and throwing our fuel pressure all off or an air leak can actually make it cause, feel like it's shutting off that way. When it happens next, pay very close attention to what's happening. Sputter, 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 die, or uh-oh, I don't have anything. That's information you want to relay to the shop, because that's going to help them, hopefully anyway, duplicate what's going on. Now, if you have VAGCOM, we not only want to look at engine faults. Is there anything causing the light to come on? or pending, a pending code hasn't went through whatever number of trips that it needs to actually illuminate the light, but it's seeing that code so you have something stored and something to go off of. If you don't have anything stored in the ECM, now we wanna look at the rest of the vehicle because maybe we have a code stored in the gateway saying, hey, I got something going on with the ECM, I'm losing communication with it, and now we can say, oh, okay, our ECM's losing comm with a bunch of different modules. Um, maybe we have a problem with the ECM or the power supply relay or power, straight up power to the ECM or something like that. So just like in the question on oil pressure, we wanna start breaking this out. Is it electrical? Is it mechanical? Is it fuel? Is it a signal? What is happening to this vehicle when it shuts off? That's going to be key information when we're talking about diagnosing these very intermittent pain in the butt kind of problems. All right, last one of the day is from Paul. Hey, longtime watcher of the channel. Bought my first German car, a B6 A4 1.8 turbo with a blown head gasket. Took the head off, took it to the machine shop. My question is about the cam chain tensioner at the rear of the head. Should I replace the tensioner while the head's out? Or is that part pretty reliable? I was unable to find the procedure in the Bentley manual for removal. Thanks, Paul. Paul, this can go either way. First of all, we want to look at the tensioner, right? Are the plastic guides broken on it? You can actually get those guides separately. I'll try and drop a link down in the description on Amazon. I think they're like 20 bucks or something like that. Way cheaper than the whole adjuster. I would probably put those pads on either way. Uh, there's no sense in having all that apart and putting it back together with pieces that are wearable pieces and those guides do tend to wear. I would also want to evaluate the overall health of the engine before the head gasket blew. Now you can't go back in time and do that, so we need to just kind of look at it as is. Did this top side of this engine look pristine, like an oil change was done at the proper interval, or is it covered in black sludge, black crust, carbon buildup, that kind of stuff? If it's carboned up, then absolutely I would probably replace it because all that stuff's probably in the adjuster too. There should be a tiny little screen on that. You want to look at that screen and see if it's clogged up at all. It's maybe, maybe not. You know, this, you'll have to do this evaluation yourself. If you're planning on keeping this car extended time, it's not the worst idea to put a new one on. Now that being said, these are 
probably pretty expensive still. I, the last one I looked at was like 800 bucks. That's a lot of money just for a, I hope this part, you know, needed to be replaced. That being said, you haven't driven the car. You don't know if it was going bad to begin with. Boy, I would hate to spend all that money and time and energy all to go, oh crap, I need an $800 timing chain tensioner and then have to take it apart and do the tensioner installation, you know, at that point. It's not hard, right? You can do this timing chain tensioner with the engine in the car, the engine all assembled. You'll take the valve cover off. I always took um, the intake cam off and you can fudge the tensioner in that way. You don't need to take all the cam, you know, both cams out, all the cam caps out, none of that. You can just take the intake cam out. You probably could do it without even taking the intake cam out if you're crafty and patient. I was never that patient, so I just zipped the intake cam off and slapped the new tensioner in. You know, oftentimes when I answer these questions, I first read it and I'm like, okay, yeah, definitely replace it or definitely don't. And then as I sort of talk through what my process would be, it tends to fall into that gray area of, I don't know, man, it really depends. What does that one look like? Does it look like it's been abused a little bit? How does the overall car look? Were there any codes stored for timing, that kind of thing? If this were a car that let's say I bought and I was gonna put my family in, I'd probably spend the $800 and put a new tensioner in it just so I didn't have to do it down the road or you know, my wife didn't end up stuck somewhere because the timing chain tensioner failed or it broke or you know, if that timing chain tensioner lets go completely, uh, you might be looking at pulling the head back off and doing the cylinder head job a second time. This time though, with bent valves rather than just a blown head gasket. So use the price, if it's 800 bucks, I'd really be looking at that part and going, eh, it looks okay, and put it back in with new pads on it. Again, I'd, I'd do those pads either way. If that part's three or $400, I'd put it on. I wouldn't be happy about it. Wouldn't be in love with spending the money that, you know, maybe I didn't have to, but I'd much rather spend that now than have to spend it down the road and do the job a second time, or maybe it costs you more money. So I'd put a chain on it, I'd put a, a timing chain tensioner on it, and then I'd never have to worry about it again, and, uh, and, and I'd call it good. But I also understand if that's out of budget, just take a really good look at it, make sure that there's no damage, no issues, the engine doesn't look like it's had sludge or carbon buildup inside of it, because if it has, then I would definitely put a new one on. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Questions or comments, drop them down below. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button. Always appreciate that. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much for watching, and I will talk to you again next time.